This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan, and I am so grateful to have a place to talk about faith and politics and big ideas in our culture with all kinds of interesting, accomplished folks of goodwill in good faith. And it is an honor to be a part of the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts that examines what's broken in our democracy and how we can work together to fix it. And the rest, you know the drill. Make sure to follow us or subscribe depending on the app you're on. And if you could take the time to write a review, that would be especially great. Um, especially if you're on, you're on Apple, it really does make a difference in terms of how people can discover this these conversations. Just like the one that we're having today with David Brooks. You might recognize David Brooks from his columns in the New York Times or his essays in the Atlantic. Perhaps you've seen him on PBS NewsHour or Meet the Press. He's also a prolific author. In fact, his 2019 book, The Second Mountain, had a significant influence on me and, in fact, was a major inspiration for me starting this program three years ago. So we'll be discussing that as well as David's new book, How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen. David, I am sincerely grateful for you coming in today. How, how are you holding up with all that you're doing to, uh, I'd imagine, launching a new book is no easy endeavor? It's uh, mental strain is what you uh, guard against. Uh, you learn, first of all, that your brain gets really tired really fast. But you also learn that, uh, apropos of this, that your, your voice is a muscle. And so I read my book for uh, Books on Tape or for Audible. Uh, and in the beginning, every, first hour of reading, I was fine. I could read through it. But after that, I was like... A guy trying to run a marathon, like the last six miles of a marathon, I just kept stumbling. It was it was telling. Wow. So do you do you end up getting any uh, voice lessons or or coaching from some friends who know that that art, you know, the muscles of your mouth or your your vocal cords or? Yeah, no, I should. But I, I used to be friends with an opera singer, and she said she would like she did all these exercises. She on the days of performances, she didn't say anything. Like she was quiet. Um, and so she respected her voice more than I respect my voice. <laughs> nothing, nothing a good bourbon can't loosen up for you, though, right? <laughs> it's been known to be tried. <laughs> I'd actually like to start ma by, by making a very, very serious observation uh, and to see what you think. Um, you can't necessarily know a person by knowing if they're a sports fan or even if you know what team they root for. But being a Mets fan is very different. <laughs> so as I was reading your book... If, if you know someone's part of that long-suffering group known as Mets fans, uh, you know, we, we diehards. We come from all different social locations, so I don't know if you can necessarily apply that, uh, that level. But there is something fundamental you can begin to understand about them as an individual. So being a Mets fan, a very serious uh, sociological observer, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, being a Mets fan is uh, to have your heart broken. The, there's been a book written about the Mets recently called So Many Ways to Lose. Uh, and that's been the life of being a Mets fan. So I was a Mets fan uh, because when I was seven or so, the Mets won the World Series in 1969 in miraculous fashion. Uh, and that taught me that life is good and miracles happen. Uh, and ever since then, <laughs> with one exception, the year 1986, they've found amazing ways to lose games, uh, dropping easy <laughs> pop-ups, um, walking people home. You, you just can't believe the number of ways they've found to lose. And this past year was a, was a lesson in humility and a lesson uh, in uh, sanctification through suffering um, because they, <laughs> they, they have a new owner who spent hundreds and hundreds of million dollars, more than was spent on any other baseball team in the history of the world, and they still managed to have a losing record. Uh, yeah. So it, it was, it's been a humbling source of humility for me. <laughs> I don't know. Are you are a big Mets fan? Die hard. Die hard. Lifelong yeah. die hard. And there's no other way to be a Mets fan other than to die hard. <laughs> so, right, right. Do you remember? Uh, do you remember your first, when you went to your first game at Shea? I do. I was uh, taken by my friends' um, uh, parents, and we all went together. And I saw a game. They played the Philadelphia Phillies, and the pitcher for the Mets was a guy named Nolan Ryan. Oh. And to show you what it's like to be a Mets fan, they drafted one of the greatest pitchers in the history of the game, and they traded him away. I'm going to say I'm, I'm relying on my childhood memory, but I think they traded away from a guy named Amos Otis, 
uh, and he was gone, and he lasted like, he pitched in the major leagues for, I don't know, two or three centuries, and he was one of the great pitchers, <laughs> and he could have been a Met all that time. He could have been a Met. I don't think he would have been completely happy until he got traded to one of the Texas teams, but that's just my thought. But uh, <laughs> my first game was sometime around 1976. I was brought by my Aunt Rhoda and Uncle Jerry, and um, I remember it really well because there was a, an exhibition game right before the regular game, and it was the Mets wives playing the cast of Happy Days. <laughs> wow. So, wow. I, got, I got my picture taken with the Fonz. It was, uh, it was sure to make me a lifelong... It, it locked me in for a lifetime of suffering. Yeah, but, but <laughs> so, you're improved, you're ennobled by it. <laughs> I was also curious about something else um, uh, about uh, growing up. When did people start calling you Brooksy, and do you stay in touch with friends who still call you that? Yeah, so I grew up in uh, Lower Manhattan. I went to a school called Grace Church School, which is on 10th and Broadway. If people know who were know New York, if they've ever been to the Strand, a bookstore, it's right there. Um, and then I went to a summer camp called Incarnation Camp in Connecticut. And because my parents clearly loved my, my company all the time, I was sent away starting at age six or seven for two months every summer uh, to sleepaway camps, uh, which is actually not uncommon in New York City because you want to get your kids out of the city in the summertime. Uh, and so I stayed at that camp from about age seven to about age 23. And so that's a lot of years. And uh, though that... That camp was my childhood, and those friends I made there um, are still my friends. And so I know very few people from my high school, but I know probably um, 60 or 70 people from my camp. And at camp, I had no first name. I was just Brooksy. Uh, and uh, people would go years and years, and even into adulthood, they didn't realize I had a first name. Uh, so they call me Brooksy. But it's very valuable to have friends. I don't know if you, you have these friends who were there you know, when you were 12, when you were 13, when you were 14 before the world of work and before various success metrics got in. Uh, and you can go back with those people and be totally yourself because they are not impressed by anything else you've done ever since. They just know you as who you were and they have extremely embarrassing stories to tell about you. <laughs> I do, in fact. I have uh, three best friends that I grew up with that we're still in very close touch with. And, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> it's not that I'm thoroughly unimpressive to them it's just that you know we've been through life together we've shared life together um the ups the downs everything in between it certainly enriches life and it uh i we have we all have kids now that are around the same age and it, it's enriching to know that they have close um uncles or godfathers if you will um you know, it really does. So you said you went there from seven to twenty-three. So you must have gone through different stages as a as a you know a camper or a counselor, but even into your into your early twenties. Uh, that's that's quite a stretch. Yeah, well, I kept failing knot tying, so they kept me back. So I was no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I was a camper, and then I was a counselor, and you know, even at an early age of fifteen, I was given really I was given tents of thirteen-year-olds to supervise. And if you want to teach somebody to grow up fast, um, give them 13, give them seven or eight 13 year old boys to supervise. And you have to deal with a lot. We went on bike trips, we went on um, canoe trips. And I, I think the, the important thing about camp for me was, first, it taught me courage. You know, in camp we did a lot of activities like cliff diving, like uh, taking canoes down rapids. They required some measure of courage. And so it, it was a good instruction in that and doing things you found scary. Uh, and then it was probably the only successfully integrated institution I've ever been part of, completely successful. And so we were about, I'd say, 30 or 40 percent white, 30 or 40 percent black, Hispanic, Asian, uh, all other varieties. Uh, we had, because it's camp, there's no economic distinctions because there's no money in camp. And so it really was a little uh, experience of to live with diversity uh, with almost complete equality, and it's not just me who say that. My black friends from camp uh, have said the same thing. So, you know, for example, one of my campers when I was a counselor was a nice kid named Jamie. And one day in 1993, I look at the front page of the New York Times, and I see a picture of a guy, and I think, wow, that's Jamie, Jamie's dad, Robert Rubin, uh, and he'd been appointed to be Secretary of Treasury. And he had been chairman of Goldman Sachs, or CEO. And I had no idea about any of this. I just knew that was Jamie's dad. He was the guy who carried Jamie's trunk into the tent when he dropped him off. 
<laughs> and so to be spared all the status uh, systems of the world is a true blessing. Before we move on, I wanted to tell you about something else that's important. Money. <laughs> uh, specifically your money. In all seriousness, I wanted to tell you about my advisor and my friend, George Meza. George runs Meza Wealth Management. And with George, it's not just about money. It's about helping us manage our present and plan for our future. And unlike a lot of other firms out there, George and I actually have a relationship. He knows me, he knows my family, and I know his wonderful family. I also know his firm and the incredible team he's put together from his chief investment officer to some of the other great people in his office, like Jessica, their head of operations that are always there to help me and with all aspects of our portfolio. You see, the thing is, I got a lot going on. I guess we all got a lot going on, and I don't have the time to watch our investments all day, every day. And even if I did, I don't have the experience and expertise that George's team collectively has. So we get the entire Mesa Wealth Management team, all their expertise and all their integrity. And again, it's based on George knowing me personally, knowing my goals, and even the kind of risk that's appropriate for me to take, which by the way, could change up from one season to the next. And they're on top of all of that. So if you want George Mesa and Mesa Wealth Management to be on your team, just visit their website, mesawealth.com. That's M-E-Z-A wealth.com, www.mesawealth.com. And that will also be in our show notes, so you can check that. And now, back to our show. I should say, if I could add one thing, as a, for lifelong friends, my wife went to a school in Illinois, I hope people have heard of, called Wheaton College. Sure. Uh, and she has a friend um, who, when they were graduating, they wanted to preserve their friendships. The, this guy and his, he wanted to preserve the friendships he'd made at Wheaton. So we went to a professor, a guy named Mark Amstutz, uh, and Amstutz said, you know, what you should do is form a giving circle. And if you get together with your 10 closest friends, and every year you put some money into a pot, it doesn't have to be a lot, and then you meet every year for three or four days, and you decide where to give away the money. And the giving away the money is a sweet part of it, but that's not the real reason you do it. You do it so you will travel through your whole life with these 10 people, and you will have 10 friends from college sticking with you all through life. Uh, and that's just bound to be uh, rewarding to have that company of, of souls to accompany you through life. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and and it's, uh, it does take effort. It takes effort. You know, I know it's... Uh, it seems easier now with text and social media and things like that to feel like you're staying in touch, but meaningful connection, actually sitting um, with someone, uh, you know, inhabiting their space and um, beholding their countenance. There's something uh, I, I think there, no matter how technological our culture gets, I, I think there is something to that, to being with someone, especially, you know, during those peaks and valleys, you know, to be with someone. Uh, I was thinking, you know, you've had friends that have gone through really difficult times uh, and someone described it as the ministry of that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, just just being with someone and, and you know, as much as you, we might be compelled to want to do something to make it better, um, just just being there, you know. Just being there, and yeah, that sucks, man. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah. Well, one of my camp friends suffered from depression when he was it hit him when he was fifty-seven, and he uh, lived with it for three years, and before finally succumbing to suicide. But so, you know, I had known him since we were eleven, uh, and so I learned how to how to talk to someone in depression, and because we'd been with each other so long, we started off with that advantage. And I still made mistakes. I didn't really understand what depression was. I didn't realize that you don't understand depression if you've never had it, if you just try to extrapolate from your moments of sadness, because that's not what depression is. Uh, it's, uh, somebody for, said it's a malfunction in the instrument you use to perceive reality. And so I made mistakes, for example, I, I would tell them, I would give them ideas of how to try to lift the depression. And I later learned when you're giving somebody ideas to how to get out of depression, all you're showing is you don't get it. Because it's not ideas they lack, it's the energy. Uh, and then finally I got to the point where I realized the futility of words and then I realized my job as a friend for somebody who's in depression is, as you say, just to say that sucks, this sucks. It's to acknowledge the reality of the situation and then to say, 
as I learned from a pastor friend of mine, I want more for you. I want more for you. Uh, and that's not saying that I can do anything about it, but I, this is what I want for you, and it's, it's not the pain you're in. And then finally, uh, Viktor Frankl, who wrote this great book, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, he, he said when he was co confronted with people contemplating suicide, he would say, life has not stopped expecting things of you, and that your gifts, and even the credibility you've gained from going through this suffering, those are gifts that you've earned, hard-earned, and you can bring them out into the world. So life has not stopped expecting things of you. And so the, those are things, some of the things I've learned through, through life of hanging around with friends who are going through something super tough. Well, I wanted to thank you for writing that chapter about your friend Peter. Toward the end of the book, you wrote, you shared a Toni Morrison quote, and it was uh, Frederick Douglass talking about his grandmother and James Baldwin talking about his father and Simone de Beauvoir talking about her mother. These people are my access to me. They are my entrance to my own interior life. The chapter that you wrote about Peter is access to me. Hmm. So uh, I'm sorry to I'm sorry to get so personal. Um, the, this probably doesn't happen on the typical interview, mm -hmm. but well, if you want to, would you tell me more about that? About what, why it hit you in that way? So I did go through a season. I've battled that my whole life, mm -hmm. and I recently went through a season, and you don't. You don't quite come out of it the same. I'm sure that those uh, demons, I don't know if you should call them demons or the season that you're in, um, but when, when they arrived, I recognized them like old, more than acquaintances. I just don't want to call them friends, mm -hmm. um, but I recognized that they were there, but I didn't realize it until I was pretty deep into it. So... I realized a few things, and um, a, a mutual, a new friend of mine, uh, that and someone that you know, Pete Weiner, um, and John Rausch, uh, I happened to talk to them right in the depths of it, and a lot of times we're just putting on our mask and doing our best to muddle through. I was so glad to get, and we had a couple different talks at that time, and then Pete followed up with me. Uh, after it, we in fact we did a tribute. We had one talk. Just you know, I love getting Pete and John together, and that was so special because they're so different, but they're they're just wonderful together. So we had a talk, and then we had a talk, uh, a tribute to um, Tim Keller and um, Mike Gerson, the two people that were on the top of my list of people I would have wanted to have had on this program that passed away. So we did a nice uh, P Pete and John did a nice tribute to them. Um, and then Pete followed up with me, and I remembered something really important, and that was I, I need uh, I need to be like an Olympic athlete in terms of discipline in order to manage this thing. Hmm. And I got away from some of that. But what I wanted to tell you that I hope is encouraging to you is that one of the greatest tools that I have is um, what I think of as um, communion with loving souls. Hmm. So... Whether it's um, just going over to watch a Mets game or a hockey game or um, lunch or coffee or something, you know, those friends who'd call out to me, even if they didn't know, like, what my situation was, um, it's a lifeline. So what you did for your friend is invaluable. I really... I, this is so weird, man. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's okay. I've been looking forward to this conversation since I started this program, and I didn't mean to. But but I do hope that it's encouraging to you that what you were doing for your friend is invaluable. Hmm. There's an eternal value to it that maybe you have some ambivalence about, but it's worth the world, man. So, hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing about that. And one of the things I've learned from those who have suffered is, is just the sheer art of presence. I have a friend named Mary who um, lost a daughter uh, to a horse accident and then nearly lost another daughter to a bike accident. And I was sitting with her while the younger daughter was recuperating. Uh, and she, uh, she, I said, well, do you, would you mind if I asked you about Anna, the one who died? And she said, people often wonder if they can bring up Anna with me. 
but they should know that Anna is always on my mind. So if they bring it up, I can talk to her. If I don't want to talk to her, I won't. But at least they've given me the chance. But then she said to me, the thing that, since I've been nursing my other daughter, the most important and most meaningful thing that's happened from a friend's point of view was that somebody came to visit us and they brought us some food and they went to the bathroom and they noticed there was no uh, bath mat in the shower. And they went out to Target and they bought a bath mat and they stuck it in the shower. And she said, they never mentioned it. They just did something practical for me. They just showed up. And that's a beautiful example of the art of presence. Uh, it's just showing up. And I agree with you that those small emotions have a sort of eternal value. They may not change anybody else's life, but they're, they have a residue that sticks around with you. One of the stories I tell in the book is about a woman named Jillian Sawyer, who was a student of mine, who lost her dad to pancreatic cancer while she was in college. And uh, a couple of years later, she was at a, a wedding of a friend of hers. She was a bridesmaid. And it was time for the father-daughter dance. And she just didn't want to sit there through it. It was too moving. And so she went to the ladies' room to have a cry. And when she came out, all the people at her table and the next table were waiting there outside the ladies' room. And they just gave her a hug. They didn't say anything. And she said, they were just present for me. It was, it was all that I needed. Yeah. And I, I'm glad that Pete and Jonathan could be there for you. Pete played a role in one of my own dark moments in life. And I, I don't know if he was like this with you, but it, I would ask him some questions. And he would ask, I mean, he would ask me some questions about my situation. And then I, I would have sort of expect the conversation to turn to him giving me advice or comfort or whatever it was. But then he would ask me another six questions. <laughs> and I learned that's the sign of a great listener, of someone who asks the extra questions that you don't anticipate. And so I'm glad you had Pete and Jonathan in, in your life, or do have them in your life at this moment. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. I, I was so thrilled when Pete initially came on the program, and then we followed up and stayed in touch and um, have this burgeoning friendship. And John, same thing. What struck me is they're two of the smartest guys that I know, and <laughs> uh, they're both such their their intelligence shines through their inquisitiveness, their genuine, earnest inquisitiveness. So I've learned I've learned a lot just from being around them. So, you know, I, I meant to ask you about something else that we share in common. I um, I, I grew up in a very observant Jewish family, we went to an Orthodox synagogue, uh, Hebrew high school and all the rest. I I became a Christian in my late 20s. Um, and when you described I don't know what to call it because I, I don't want to say conversion it's almost, it's more like a evolution or a step. I, it's, it's weird to say I became a Christian. It's almost overly uh, distilling it too much. Um, but I don't know too many other folks who grew up in a Jewish family and are, you know, clearly uh, deeply rooted with their heritage and their grandparents and great grandparents that then, you know, became a Christian uh, later in life. So the, the way you describe it in The Second Mountain, you, you said the main story is the soul story. So I was curious if, if you could share some of your soul story. Yeah, it was, I, I'd be curious to know after this um, how you came, found Christianity. I, I had this weird background where I grew up in a Jewish home and, of course, have sent, we had a Seder and I had a bar mitzvah and we did all that. And then as an adult, I kept kosher for many years at home. Uh, but I also grew up going to this church school. Uh, and we went to chapel, and I was in the choir briefly. And so we, I knew the Jesus story, too, and I went to this camp I mentioned before that was a Christian camp. And so I had the two stories rattling around in my head. Uh, and, but it didn't matter. They were, didn't seem like contradictory to me and still don't. But they didn't seem real to me either because I didn't think there was such a thing as God, so they were just stories. And then as I got older, um, with nothing too dramatic, but just the the categories I had in my head were not commensurate with reality as I experienced it. So reality seemed to me porous. It seemed to me transcendent. It seemed to me iconoclastic, that there's a reality beyond the material reality. And I experienced that. It sounds like you may be a New Yorker. I experienced it in um, one of the ugliest places on God's green earth, which was one of the ugly places is Penn Station, the old Penn Station in New York. <laughs> and then if you want to get something even uglier, you go to the subway stop near Penn Station. 
<laughs> so uh, I was at the subway, and I had this sensation looking around at all the other people in the subway that they all had souls. And they had souls in them that were soaring or suffering uh, or were joyful or were fretful. Uh, and once you get to the idea that every human being you meet has a soul of some transcendent value, to me it was a reasonably short step over to believing there's a God. And then believing there's a God, the Christian story seemed to me the completion of the Jewish story or the next phase of the Jewish story. Jesus obviously was a Jewish guy who emerged out of Jewish teaching. And I didn't have any great moments where like Jesus walked through the wall and told me to follow him. It was more like I was riding on a train and all around me the people were pretty much normal, reading the paper, drinking coffee. And I look out the window and I see that we've come, we've traveled a long way. And somehow we've crossed a, bar a boundary and we've left the world of secularism or of atheism and now we're somewhere in the world of belief. Uh, and so there's no dramatic moment but you realize you've traveled. And the rest of the, my life has been filling in and seeing what that, that traveling means. So can, can I ask you, when you were, when you discovered Christianity, how, how did it first enter your radar screen? Well, I, I had a couple of guys that I was, that were mentoring me in business. Part of what they were doing was they were referring me to books. And um, every damn book they gave me was a Jesus, or what I considered a Jesus book. And being a Jew, you know, with uh, Brooklyn and New Jersey and my people, we have sort of an allergy to a particular form of evangelical Christianity. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, I read the books for the information and tried to just overlook this annoyance of the, the whole Jesus thing. But eventually I took my friend to task. I thought I was taking my friend to task about it. <laughs> and I said, what's up with the Jesus thing? And he gave me another book. <laughs> mm -hmm. The first one he gave me was, I think it was called More Than a Carpenter. It, 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 was, it was a relatively short book, but it was the first time I had read anyone trying to make an empirical case for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And I still was thoroughly unconvinced, but it opened a door for me. And that, that time, it was um, 2000. So from spring through fall of 2000, I had a voracious reading habit. So I was reading... I read a larger book called um, Evidence That Demands a Verdict that went into much more detail. But then I started reading C.S. Lewis, and I found that a lot more philosophically uh, compelling. But I also started reading answers to C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton. Bertrand Russell, I found really com – and those conversations you know, between Russell and guys like Chesterton were really interesting. And I finally started it, – it, I think it's something that was in me, the questions – were forming in me from when I was a child in Yom Kippur services. So I was really, the, the, the soil was turned over pretty well. By the time I finally brought myself to read the New Testament, I, when I went to the beginning of that coll the collection, the New Testament, in Matthew, uh, five chapters in, I came across what I recognized as, um, as a Devar Torah. You know, the, rap, the, the Jesus, as the rabbi, was giving this brilliant of our Torah. And I, I didn't realize I was reading the Sermon on the Mount. You know, I heard the sermon, I'd heard the expression, the Sermon on the Mount, but, you know, uh, I, I didn't know what it was. And I just, wow, this is an, this is incredible. This is an incredible uh, interpretation of Torah. I also saw that his interactions with the Pharisee characters looked a lot like uh, if you stay after shul on, on, on Shabbos, uh, and you listen to the rabbi and, and his brother or the cantor or any of the elders, you know, having lunch. You know, so somebody has a Kaddish. Uh, and that's just what conversation sounds like between Jesus and the Pharisees. That's just what conversation sounds like. So it felt very much at home to me. That, that's really how it came about. I, I, I got through it in a couple days, you know, and then Revelation 21 and 22, how that makes a full circle to Genesis 1 and 2. There was something about that that, that I found really compelling. I, I was more surprised by how it all came about than, than just about anybody, but there it is. Just questions that I need answering to, and it seemed coherent. Uh, the, the, the existential questions that seem to be answered. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's obviously going to be an ongoing journey. It was important for me to, to, that, to see Jesus as a Jew and that there are all sorts of versions of Jesus that are out there. There's the Renaissance art Jew, Jesus, which is sort of the guy with wispy guy with two fingers in the air and blonde hair 
And then frankly, there's the Oxford Jesus of, of Lewis and Tolkien. But to me, the, the Jesus who was a Jew is the guy who lived in Galilee at a time of revolution, a time of, of mass strife, of sometimes mass murder, of colonial occupation. And this Jesus is a total badass. He's a, he's a guy who, who takes all the power structures around him and he flips them over all at once. And so, as you know, as somebody who used to cover the Middle East, um, it was important for me to see him flowing out of the Jewish world and struggling and fighting and combating uh, within that world. And if anybody has been to Jerusalem, you know how crowded it is, how dense it is with different factions and uh, different groups of people all vying for a small piece of real estate. And so it somehow felt connected to me that this guy was a total renegade. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you have any ambivalence? You know, you talk a lot about your grandparents' generation, your great-grandparents' generation, uh, and, and you still, you, you know, you, you can't shake being, we're still Jewish, you know, so do, do you have any ambivalence uh, when you think about your being Jewish and uh, what what your grandparents might, yeah. might have thought? Yeah, I'd, I'd have uh, mountains of ambivalence. Uh, and so, you know, some of it is, for that, but you know, some of it, I haven't lost any friends. My Jew, you know, I lived very much in the Jewish world, sent my kids to Jewish schools, and all my friends have been very understanding. And you know, there's been some tension for a time, but it's gone away. I think my main ambivalence uh, is in times like these. We're talking in the middle of um, violence in the Middle East, we're talking amid an upsurge in anti Semitism around the world, uh, and at times like these, I, I want to. I don't want to feel like I left this group. And to be honest, as a person, in terms of my ethnic background, my peoplehood, I feel more Jewish than I ever felt before, because I, I now believe that the, the stories told in Exodus are true. They actually, you know, they're, they're uh, supremely true. Uh, and so I, I, I experienced peoplehood as a Jew, but I guess I just always experienced faith as a Christian. Uh, and so, uh, but I never want to feel myself that I'm walking away from a people who are embattled, especially in the world like today. So you say your peoplehood as a Jew, but your faith as a Christian. Could you could you unpack that a little bit more? Yeah. So you know, I'm. Uh, so what does it mean to be a Jew? I mean, in my book, I have a, a conversation starter that we should ask: How do our ancestors show up in their li- in our lives? Yeah. And so we're all formed by the legacies of our ancestors. And so I was formed by thousands of years of Jewish history. And some of those legacies are kind of obvious that um, we're the people of the book and I became a writer. Uh, some are cultural. Uh, we tend to be pretty argumentative in Judaism <laughs> argument. Uh, prayer is done as an argument. We argue with each other in yeshivas and things like that. And I frankly, in the Christian world, I've sometimes had to tone down my tendency to want to start an argument every day. <laughs> uh, and so, Oh, I've been kicked out of Bible studies <laughs> based on my... <laughs> Right. Wait, what is this saying right here? Let's look, you know. Yeah. And so there's that. And then I think the one of the things I didn't appreciate till recently is the Hebrews, they were, the Israelites were a, a small people in a faraway marginal part of the world. And yet their conception of humanity was that God had centered all around humanity around them, uh, this small people in a faraway part of the world. And the, yet we're the center of history. And that is an audacious claim. And it comes with a responsibility, the, that the responsibility to live up to a covenant, the responsibility to really a moral responsibility to heal the world. And so I do think that set intense moral pressure, uh, which flows through Jewish history, um, flows through me as well. So uh, there's that. And then finally, um, I just think Jews are funny. <laughs> and so sometimes when I'm at a you know, I'm at a, a gathering, I was at a, a gathering of Christian leaders not so long ago, and there were three really good speeches gave, and being egotistical, I think I gave a pretty good speech. And all three of them, those people who gave the really good speeches, were had Jewish heritages, even though they were Christians. And I said to myself quietly, you know, all the smartest Christians are Jews. <laughs> yeah, you shared the expression uh, growing up, think Yiddish, act British. We, I always think of the Sid Caesar show. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we were we were not the huggy kind of uh, fiddler on the roof kind of Jews. We were the intellectual kind. I wonder, too, a lot of the Christian writing that you refer to, Wendell Berry, some of my favorites, Wendell Berry, 
I wish that I was more, my head was more in that world, but I live in um, a valley where uh, Masters University is, John MacArthur. So I'm surrounded by MacArthurian <laughs> acolytes. And it's, um, I, I bring this up because I, I, I certainly have ambivalence about my ancestry, my heritage. I feel, and to your point, I feel more Jewish now than ever before. But my other ambivalence, frankly, is American Christ, uh, evangelicalism. Is that uh, is that something that that you struggle with as well? Yeah, well, I uh, became Christian in 2013. I always say becoming Christian in 2013 is like investing in the stock market in 1929. Uh, it was not the best timing, um, and so there's been a lot of you know Ravi Zachariah. There's been scandal upon scandal uh, in those days, and Christian nationalism has risen and spread, which is not my favorite cup of tea. Uh, but you know, and but I also. I knew nothing about the world I was entering. And so when I, in, in those early days, I thought being an American Christian meant you read Tim Keller, you read C.S. Lewis, you read Tolkien, uh, and people like that, N.T. Wright, or something like that. Uh, and I didn't realize there was a whole different world of Christian nationalism and, and sort of the broader evangelical world that had nothing to do with the, those people. Uh, and so I told a friend of mine who runs a seminary that I, I thought being Christian was like reading Tim Keller. That's what Christians do. And he said, oh, you thought it was all the Shire. You thought the Shire was the whole thing. <laughs> but no, it's not. It's a lot more than the Shire out here. <laughs> oh, man. I, I wish that, uh, that that was more my world. But I, I bump up against it uh, m- more often. It, it, does, it does make it harder. Um, but you put it a certain way where... You know your your faith is um, the level or the strength of your faith is not that it's elusive, but it depends on the day. <laughs> you know, so you wake up and can I, you know, answer these questions all over again? Yeah, it w- I was really helped by Frederick Buechner, who made that quote. He said, "You should wake up every day, you should read the New York Times, and you should ask yourself, can I believe it all over again?" And he writes that if you say that yes to that question ten days out of ten. Um, then you probably don't have the kind of faith I have. But if you can answer it three or four days out of ten, you should answer that question yes with joy and great laughter. Uh, mm. And so I, I, I'm, when Beekner gave me permission to have those moments of dryness or distance from God, that was uh, very useful and very helpful for me. Yeah. You know, I, I also wanted to talk to you about Weave. Um, it, is Weave... A, a product of the convictions from the work that you did on writing the second mountain, or is it the other way around, or is it more symbiotic? You, uh, so we, for, I guess, first share with folks what Weave is. You're a co-founder of this great organization. Yeah, so I, it, it's more symbiotic. So it, at about the time in the mid 2010s, uh, I was just noticing this social breakdown, uh, and that's the rise of depression, the rise of suicide. Uh, 54% of Americans say that knows, no one knows them well. Uh, the number of people who say they have no close personal friends has gone up by four times since 2000. Uh, 45% of teenagers say they're persistently hopeless and despondent. Just so much social pain in the world. And it manifests as loneliness and distrust and disconnection. Uh, and so I realized that this problem is being solved at the local level by people we call weavers, who are community builders, who are just really good at building trust and making connection. And so at Weave, this little nonprofit, we would travel around the country and just go to places and say, who's trusted here? And it might be the, you know, in one place, it was the guy who ran the parking garage that uh, there was this guy and he ran a parking garage, but he had an obsession with city zoning regulation. So if you had a problem with the city, you go to that guy and he helps you out. And so he's a trusted member of that community. Or there was another lady in Florida Uh, she just volunteers to help kids cross the street after elementary school so they're safe. And we asked her, do you get paid to do this? She said, no. And we asked her, do you have time to volunteer in your neighborhood? And she said, no, I don't have any time to volunteer. And then we said, well, what are you doing after this? And she said, well, on Thursdays, I take food to the hospital so the patients will have some nice food. And we asked again, do you have time to volunteer? And she said, no, I have no time. And to her, what she was doing was not Volunteering is just what neighbors should do. And so these people are rebuilding trust, are rebuilding connection, 
and rebuilding community. And so WEAVE is an effort to um, uh, support them, sometimes financially, sometimes culturally, sometimes psychologically. And we bring them around the country to tell their story so other people will be inspired to live a little like this. And this new book, How to Know a Person, uh, flows out of the same problem. I came to realize while working at WEAVE that words like relationship and community are good words, but they're kind of abstract. And the actual act of building community is the act of performing a series of small social actions really well. How do you be a great conversationalist? How do you listen well? How do you disagree well? How do you ask for and offer forgiveness? How do you sit with someone who's in grief? And so the book is really an attempt just to walk people through these skills so we can be better at the moral skills of being considerate to other human beings. I, I was curious, you, you mentioned uh, in how, how to Know a Person, the new book, that you interviewed hundreds of community builders. Um, do, are there any others? Uh, I'd love to hear about some more of the folks that you interviewed and uh, maybe some of the things that you learned from those conversations. Sure, I've got lots of stories about that. So, for example, another guy I met in Houston named Pancho Arguiles, um, he has an organiza- used to run an organization called uh, uh, Living Hope Wheelchair Association. Uh, and so it takes uh, people who have been paralyzed in construction accidents, most of them Hispanic, uh, and it gives them wheelchairs and diapers and catheters so they can lead dignified lives. And then it trains them in becoming social workers. So you'll be in Houston and this group of 25 Latino guys in, in wheelchairs will roll in your neighborhood and help you work on your community's problems. And I once said to Pancho, you know, you radiate holiness. And he says to me, no, I reflect holiness. Oh. Which is the right answer. Uh, and so he, he said, like, as the country was sliding into despair and over the bitterness of the last five years or so, I've been surrounded by some of the most uplifting and selfless people it's possible to imagine. And they're in every town. You just go into a town and say, who's, li- who's trusted here? And people start spitting out names, and often they're the same names. Uh, and so there is an army of people who are really selflessly living for their community. And they may be helping kids in the neighborhood. They may be cleaning up empty lots. Uh, whatever the neighborhood needs, they assume responsibility. Uh, a lot of us see a problem and they think, well, somebody else should fix that. <laughs> but these people automatically say, no, I'm going to fix that. I assume responsibility here. It sounds like it was convicting for you uh, that, that maybe you know, this was part of your second mountain, if you will, or, or um, another way you put it. I forget if it's in the second mountain or, or the how to know a person. You describe if you draw a line through times you felt most fulfilled, uh, weave would be a part of it. So Yeah, that's from uh, Nietzsche. He, he says, uh, draw a line through the four or five most rewarding experiences of your life and see if there's a thematic constancy to them. See if they all share some common theme. And he writes, if you can discover that common theme, you've discovered the law of your very nature. And I think for me, it's the common theme. It would seem to be writing superficially, but really it's teaching. That my biggest joy comes from learning something from some wise person and then putting it in a book or an article. And then somebody else writes it down because they find it helpful. Uh, And that's the most rewarding thing I do. And so I'm more of a teacher. And one of my favorite phrases about writing is, we writers are beggars who tell other beggars where we found bread. So we're just trying to share what's helpful. You know, I was curious about that. I forget if it was a, a talk that you gave or one of your columns where you describe your writing process. And it sounds like you're kind of like a, a collage maker, but with words. In other words, if I remember correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you, re, you read a lot. Um, you're learning a lot. And then you're taking things that strike you and then you're organizing them around, say, 10 paragraphs of a column. Is do do I remember that right? Or or I'd love for you to share a little bit more about your your process. Yeah. So I um, have a bad memory. And so I uh, I'm always taking notes and I'm uh, I'm always printing out things that I find useful or relevant for whatever I'm writing about. And so when I sit down, for example, to write a column, I'll probably have maybe a notebook worth of notes and then maybe 200 pages worth of research that I've done that I've marked up with my pen. And so I lay it out on the floor in piles. And each pile is going to be a paragraph in my column. And so if you look at me while I'm writing, I'm not typing into a keyboard. 
I'm crawling around the floor of my living room putting <laughs> pieces of paper into different piles. And there might be 14 or 15 piles for one 850-word column. And then I, when I'm done organizing the, col- the piles, I pick up a pile, I bring it to the desk, I write it up, then I throw out those pages and I go back and get the next pile and I write that up. Uh, and that's how I'm doing it. So I tell my students, when you're writing, by the time you sit at the keyboard, your paper should be 80% done because writing is about structure and traffic management. It's about getting things in the right order and getting to your point quickly. Uh, and so I, uh, that's my process of, of just, I need to see it geographically laid out in front of me for me to have any coherent sense of what it is I have to say. That seems very rigorous. It, it seems, you know, I, I think the impression is uh, you're, you're just brilliant and, and you come up with these brilliant words and ideas and you, you jot them down and, and uh, New York Times or The Atlantic or whoever it might be uh, takes it, you know, but, but it's a very rigorous process that you're describing. That's, that's what struck me when I first learned about it. Are you driven by your curiosity or what, what drives you to go back and do it again? Uh, I'm driven by the fact that I always have a column due in a few days, so <laughs> <laughs> deadline. Uh, so yeah. a friend of mine said the most important quality a piece can have is the quality of doneness, just getting it done. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I settled on this method because, you know, primarily I'm a newspaper writer, so I have to be fast. I have to be able to write an article in, you know, a few hours. Uh, and to me, this method is just a lot more efficient than sitting at the keyboard and trying to noodle my brain around into writing something coherent. And if I try to do that, it, I just wander around heedlessly for hour upon hour. So this is my way of making it more efficient. How much reading do you do? Because I, I think you said that you you write daily, uh, several hours a day, but I would imagine it also requires a ton of, of reading. How much How much reading do you do on a daily or weekly basis? An enormous amount. Though I don't read the way normal people read. I, I read to steal. Some people read to appreciate, I read to steal. <laughs> so I'm reading <laughs> for points that I can quote or, or arguments that I can uh, refer to. And so I'll have, you know, I'm on a trip right now, I'm in Chicago, and in my backpack I think I probably have seven or eight or nine books in there. And I'm going through them and I'm underlining. Uh, and then someday I will uh, synthesize them into a column. Yeah, I found it tremendously, I don't know about I'm going to ask you this, mm. I found it tremendously helpful to realize what my actual skill is. So in theory, you can say broadly, I write. That's my profession. But my actual skill is synthesis. If you give me a mass of data, I can find a pattern in it. And it may not be right, but it will be a pattern. And th- that's what I do. I synthesize masses of data into one pattern. And so... Mm. I'm not like a novelist or I'm, I'm a synthesizer looking for the patterns in the universe. And once I appreciate, well, that's what I do. That's my, my one magic trick. Um, then I can do it over and over again in different topics. And I find it tremendously rewarding when I find a pattern and it seems to make sense of what was only confusion. I don't know if you sense a talent like that in yourself. I think I'm still trying to figure it out, to be honest. <laughs> um, how do you curate what you end up reading? Is it based on recommendations or do you pick up references in, in one book or essay and then that leads you to, you know, uh, for example, someone might reference uh, William, William F. Buckley or, or uh, we talked about Bertrand Russell and then that prompts you to read something, some Russell es- essays. Is that how you end up curating? Is it more of a meandering process or it's is it more directed? Super meandering. I actually had to go back and look through I had an old person recently and as I'm reading a book, which took me four years to write, I'm remembering all the chapters I wrote that I cut out. I'm remembering, like, I saw one sentence that's in the current final version of the book, but in an earlier version, it was an entire chapter of about 15,000 words, and it got reduced to one sentence. Uh, so you're, <laughs> when you go back and read your own book, you're aware of all the many layers. And so for this book, I, I want to know, like, what are the skills to get to know somebody? And so I did this meandering journey. I read some books about conversation. I read a ton of memoirs because I wanted to see how memoirists present themselves. I read a ton of biographers because biographers are really good at um, knowing a person, knowing their research subject. The people I spoke to who were among the most rewarding were actors uh, because actors have to get into a role. And I found them to be extremely articulate in explaining to me how they understand the characters they're playing. So, for example, I interviewed 
Matthew McConaughey, and he said, when I am investigating a role, I try to figure out what's the physical gesture that this person uses that sort of characterizes their whole personality. So he said to me, at one point I, I was playing a guy who was a hands in the front pocket kind of guy, a guy who keeps his hands in his front pockets, he's sort of, um, st st his shoulders are bent in, he's sort of stooped in on himself. And as he was des describing that, I was thinking of like a Richard Nixon, a guy who carries himself a little stooped in posture. And he says, if I've got a guy who's stooped in, when he's trying to be assertive, he's going to be fake. He's not going to be naturally himself, so he's going to overdo it. So I had to know that that was going to be the role. And so that was the way Matthew McConaughey achieved some psychological depth in understanding his character. And I found, read interviews with other actors who are, are like the same. If anybody remembers the John Adams miniseries that probably was put on maybe a decade or so ago, uh, Paul Giamatti plays John Adams. And he said, I really came to understand Adams when I realized he's, um, he has psychosomatic illnesses. He always thinks he's sick. So he walks through the world constantly in a sour temper because he thinks he's sick. And that helped me give a little dyspeptic edge to his personality. So, and if, if you want to increase the empathy levels of your, your kids, enroll them in drama. The, the, one of the great ways to increase empathy is to have them play somebody else on stage. You're, you're preaching to the choir. So uh, I, I studied um, method acting in New York mm. for a number of years. And are you are you doing any acting now? Did you did you enjoy it? You know, I I, I ran a, um, a a theater and film ensemble, a little tiny, you know, uh, uh, collaborative, uh, where sometimes we would do short films and we did uh, some Shakespeare and Chekhov and uh, it, uh, Tartuffe. We did a Moliere play. We did some nice pieces together. I did that for about 15 years. Uh, it started out as a, a ministry. <laughs> so when they when they first approached me about doing the uh, the, the drama ministry, my I, I'm a New York theater snob. So my first thought was, what could be worse than community theater? Is church theater? <laughs> so we uh, yeah we ended up. But I set some impossible hurdles for them that they they said, oh that's a great idea. You know, I said, well if we're going to do this, I'm we're just going to do a year's worth of training, some classical and method training. And the, the worship pastor said, oh, that's a great idea. You know, and I, I was thinking, no, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> but we, uh, we ended up doing some really great, great work together. Um, but when I discovered, um, when I discovered this medium, the podcast medium, a lot of the same, I don't know, juices, a lot of the same uh, itches were, are scratched. Uh, a lot of the same motivations and, and inspirations um, you know, the very first podcast I listened to, uh, my producer's hat kicked into gear, my artistic director's hat kicked into gear, and I just thought, man, the conversations you could have and the stories you could tell on this medium are really unique. Uh, so I started becoming a student of, of podcasting as a medium, mm. and that's when we uh, started, not too long after that, about six months after that, we produced our first, uh, our first program. Um, you know, and then three years ago, we started this one, and we're, we're still learning. Uh, so. Um, so speaking of this program, I have, a, I have the TPNR question, the Talk of Politics and Religion question for you. Um, what do you think each of us can do to be able to share space with, to have better conversations with, perhaps even nurture relationships with people across our differences? So that includes people who think differently than we do have different beliefs than we do, who get their news from different sources than we do, how can we do better at talking politics and religion without killing each other, or is it even possible? Yeah. Well, first, get really great at conversation in general. And so in the book, I collected a bunch of conversational tips from people just um, so I could um, try to be a better conversationalist because none of us are as good as we think we are. Yeah. And so some of those are treat attention as an on-off switch, not a dimmer. So if you're going to be in conversation with them, it should be 100% attention or 0%, but don't try to multitask it. Another tip I got was uh, don't be a topper. If somebody tells you a story, uh, I'm having trouble with my teenage kid, your instinct is to say, oh, I know exactly what you're going through. I'm having trouble with my teenage kid. And that sounds like we're trying to relate. But what we're really trying to do is take the conversation back so we can talk about myself. Uh, and so don't be a topper. But then, as you know, the subject of this podcast, sometimes you're having fights, you're, you're disagreeing, you have different views, you have different news sources. And so there, one of the things you can do is keep the gem statement in the center. If we disagree, there's probably something deep down 
that we agree upon. So if my brother and I are fighting about our dad's health care, we both want what's best for our dad. And if we can find that thing we agree upon, then we'll save the relationship amid the disagreement. Another one is find the disagreement under the disagreement. So sometimes we'll have a disagreement about the Middle East or podcast or what, what good behavior is. But usually we disagree because we have some deep philosophical disagreement underneath the surface disagreement we're having. So instead of fighting uh, and making statements at each other, making statements at each other is not a good conversation. That's a bad conversation. A good conversation is a joint exploration. It's when we look at something together and we go on a journey. We go on a journey of discovery. And so we find out, well, why are we really disagreeing? And that turns a conflict into something kind of fun. And then my primary rule is when somebody is disagreeing with you, and sometimes their disagreement will come as critique of you, that you don't understand or you're part of the problem, that in those circumstances, the instinct is to get all defensive and say, well, I'm one of the good guys. You don't understand. Or to say, well, you don't know what I'm dealing with. But I've learned that your first job in any conflictual, conflicting disagreement is to stand in the other person's standpoint. That is to say, to ask them three or four times in three or four different ways, where are you coming from? Uh, how'd you come to believe that? I no longer ask people, what do you believe? I always ask, how'd you come to believe that? Because I want them to be telling me a story. I want them to be telling me a story about um, some person who shaped their values or some experience that shaped their values. Uh, and then if I can ask them that three or four times, then I'm getting some depth. And I may not end up agreeing with them, but at least I'll have shown them the respect of curiosity. And there's a great book called Crucial Conversations on how to have hard conversations. And the authors of that book write, in any conversation, respect is like air. Uh, when, it, when it's present, uh, nobody notices. And when it's absent, it's all anybody can think about. And so at least I've shown respect. And that's Crucial Conversations? Yeah, it's a great book um, written by about six different authors. Uh, one of the, the one I know is a guy named Joseph Grenny. He's one of the authors. It's one of the best conversation books I've ever come across. And you also mentioned a friend of our show, uh, Monty Guzman's uh, book from last year. I never thought of it that way. So that, that's another one. we. Uh, but I have, to, I have to check out Crucial Conversations. Yeah, her book is great. He, she, uh, she's got a great question she asks people, which is, why you? Why was it you who decided to run for school board? Why was it you who founded that church? Like, what was it about you that caused you to behave that way? And that's a good way to let people talk about their life. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned, you know, stealing from, you know, all these great thinkers. That's, I, I feel very much like that. Pete Seeger once, uh, somebody said, hey, you know, I think somebody stole that song from you. And uh, Pete's uh, the great folklore, uh, you know, folk singer. He said, "Well, he might be stealing from me, but I steal from everybody." <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Steal. There's a saying: stealing from one person is plagiarism. Stealing from everybody is creativity. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, did you, you know, before I, I start to wrap it up, one more question. Since you mentioned Mike Gerson and Tim Keller, I was wondering if you would uh, share some thoughts uh, about uh, those fellows. They're two. Uh, gentlemen that I, I never had the chance to meet, but, uh, you know, like I said, they were definitely high on my list of folks that I'd want to have on this program. So I was hoping that you could share some tribute or, or thoughts about both of those guys. Yeah, so I've known, I knew Mike Gerson for probably for 20 or 30 years. Um, and so we came up in politics together. He, I was a journalist and he was uh, in a Senate aide and then a White House aide. Uh, and so I think what I think of was Mike first just the gorgeous prose style, if anybody remembers, say, the speech George W. Bush gave at the National Cathedral after 9-11, uh, just a beautiful expression of conscience. And I would say that was Mike's great gift, that he, he was, uh, as a columnist and as a public servant, just a living conscience. He, he brought, basically, uh, Catholic social teaching, 2,000 years of Christian theology, to bear on the public square. And he was, he really, was beatitudinal in his conscience. He was, um, you know, the last shall be first. He, he, was, he was, his love was for those on the margins. And he was instrumental, as Pete and Jonathan probably mentioned, in the creation of PEPFAR, uh, President Bush's anti-HIV initiative in Africa. And so he was instrumental in a program 
that um, saved millions and tens of millions of lives. And what a contribution to the world that is. And I saw him toward the end of his life, he, he really had the book of Job thrown at him. He had cancer, he had heart problems, he had depression. And yet when I saw him a few days before he died, uh, he was telling stories, and they were mostly stories of gratitude for somebody who had been uh, unnecessarily kind to him. And it was just interesting to sit there uh, as, the, as those stories just came out. And he, he was beautiful uh, at the very end. And then Tim Keller, I probably have known him for 10 years or knew him for 10 years. Uh, and he was uh, crystalline in his logic. He was somebody who had a very systematic thinker. He had an encyclopedic knowledge. And so his sermons were so beautiful and curious because he was always exploring the Gospels. And I think what under, gets underappreciated with Tim was how joyful he was. Uh, we would have these Zoom conversations and he was always like leaning back and hanging around. Uh, he was not stiff and formal. He was just like, well, here's what I think. Um, and, uh, but he, he had a lightness of spirit. And if you're going to be a Christian, you better have a lightness of spirit because that's sort of what it's all about. And so as much as I admire the intellect that Tim brought to the world, I think I admire that genuine warmth uh, that sometimes could be hid behind his massive intellect. But, you know, he began his career as a pastor in a small church in Virginia. And it was a church where only 5% of the people had gone to college. And so he related person to person, not as some sort of academic way. Uh, and I think he always understood that was a, a higher form of intelligence than you might get at a, getting a PhD in theology. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, through, you know, through our conversation with, with Pete and John and, and what, what others have shared, um, it's been great feeling like I've gotten to know uh, those guys. So I, I appreciate your, your thoughts on that. Um, before we start to close it up, did you have any questions for me? Yeah, I guess I, I'm, I'm just become very curious, and maybe this is boring for your listeners, but if you could give me a two-minute summary of, it sounds like your career has been uh, a journey. So I'm just curious, like, how you went from here to there. Oh, so, uh, yeah, so I, <laughs> I started out as a stockbroker during the day going to a theater conservatory at night um, and have been uh, an entrepreneur, uh, you know, and small business owner, most of my adult life. Um, but your, your book really, I, I think I was starting really grappling with um, vocational questions uh, at that point in my life. And I think I read The Second Mountain once we were in lockdown for pandemic. So to think of what I could do with this next chapter of my life, to think of it in terms of doing something more meaningful, doing, t taking what I think I do okay and, you know, uh, taking some things that I have a capacity for, uh, bringing them all together um, and in such a way that uh, addresses some of the problems that I see in the world. So, because for me, since, you know, it's funny because w when I became a Christian, uh, I realized I had to have some tough conversations about religion or our heritage or theological questions with my family. But when I went into the church, especially out here in this uh, region, I realized that there were a lot of folks I was going to church with where their social and political uh, preferences, uh, positions, took precedence, even if the Bible bumped up against it, even if what we were reading uh, in Scripture was at, at very much at odds with it. So I, I've had to have very difficult quest, uh, conversations about that. Um, and it was something I was seeing out in the world as well. I was seeing a, a hardening, a, a callousing, a othering. Not that I had all the answers, but I wanted to explore these problems and these questions with people that I thought were already contributing to the solution. So folks like you have been, um, I, that's, that's why it's so special to have you on the program today. Guys like John Rausch and, you know, the epistemic problem that he addresses in Constitution of Knowledge and Pete, you know, identifying early on that, you know, Trump, Trump ain't the thing in <laughs> July of 2020 or June of 2015 or Monty Guzman or Lisa Sharon Harper. Uh, these these wonderful people who've contributed so much to diagnosing the problem, 
and, and coming up with solutions and participating in the solutions. So that's, um, yeah, I, does that answer your question? Yeah, yep, for sure. Thank you. So before we wrap up, how can folks follow you, find your latest book, How to Know a Person, your writing in the time, in New York Times, The Atlantic, and all the great work that you're doing? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty available. Uh, if you go to the New York Times, you might have to pay some money, uh, but you can read my columns there. I also write for The Atlantic. And then How to Know a Person, uh, the, it's called The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen, and it's available at Amazon, on Barnes & Noble, at Target, um, wherever books are sold. And those links will definitely be in the show notes, so look for that. Thank you so much for doing this. This this really is a highlight for me. You've been someone, you've been a teacher of mine uh, in a very concrete way for, for quite a few years. And uh, getting to actually speak to you is just a real, uh, it's a real treat. So I, I just want to thank you sincerely. Oh, thank you. It's been a very uh, unique, it's not a normal podcast experience, so much better, more interesting. So thank you. Yeah, I guess your your interviewers don't typically come to tears <laughs> five minutes in. So I, I thank you for indulging me and uh, being patient. Your, your grace is, is uh, very much appreciated. Oh, no, I'm, I'm pleased to be part of it. And thank you for, for joining us and, and listening. As always, if you appreciate what we're doing here, please subscribe, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and writing that review really means a ton. It, re- it really helps us. Uh, so please do that and tell a friend about Talk Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. We're easy to recommend at politicsandreligion.us, www.politicsandreligion.us. Or you can find me online at Corey S. Nathan. That's Corey with an E-S as in Sam, at Corey S. Nathan. Now go talk some politics and religion, but with gentleness and respect, and have a great week.